Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxon. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Polly Hudson. So Polly uh, is an expert in Skinner releasing technique. She'll describe what that is. Um, She's with the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, uh, which is a lecturer. She has a PhD in the Skinner releasing work we'll talk about. Um, Describes herself as a dancer, teacher, and artist. So involved in all kinds of different interesting aspects of movement and the art. So Polly, welcome. Hi, Mark. Hey, how did you get interested in the body? What was your story with this? So I was, um, I went to dance classes when I was a little girl, like tiny ballet classes. And, um, but, but beyond that, actually, my interest in the body was uh, a very formative years with my mum and gardening um, and uh, earlier memories about being embodied, I guess, are not ballet classes because that didn't feel very embodied when I was five or six years old. Actually, it was digging the earth with my mother. Um, and being outside, dancing around in the grass, rolling down hills, that kind of stuff. And later I got into um, more into dance and into contemporary dance and through the youth dance scene in the UK, which is a really fabulous way in for young people to creative dance and contemporary dance outside the sort of Dolly Dingle dance schools. So that's kind of how I got into it, really. And then I, was, then I studied, I went to dance school. I went to... Uh, conservatoire london contemporary dance school when i was 16 years old which is very young and they don't take students at that age anymore i think for very good reason so polly so the conservatoire i'm one of those people that doesn't really understand what that is or that world very much like i've never been in the modern or contemporary dance world what's it like to go to a modern dance conservatoire as, as you say even the word sounds funny to me it does um it it It's very different now from how it was then, but uh, historically, and when I went, it was a, it's a differentiated from a degree study in a university uh, because it's a professional uh, dance or acting training. And that was the differentiation. However, now most uh, conservatoires sit inside a university and are validated by universities in the UK. And that's a that's a situation in terms of the conservatoire that I work in now. It sits inside Birmingham City University. Historically, I think that happened because of funding, to be honest. But I don't really know the ins and outs of why that shift happened. But it, it's fundamentally a, a professional, uh, vocational training in uh, contemporary dance or acting or whatever subject, music, whatever subject matter it is. And 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 do you just dancing all day long, or is there like lots of theory? I mean, excuse my ignorance here, but like conservatoire dance yeah. training. Yeah. Um, well, I think again that that's changed. So when I was there, so this, we're talking this thirty years ago, nineteen eighty eight. It was a very different place from what they are now. So then it was well, it's still practical, practically based. I think students on average do twenty five to thirty hours in the studio a week. Now there's lots of teaching around philosophy and underpinning theories, but from an embodied perspective. Uh, 30 years ago, that that wasn't happening so much. And actually, 30 years ago, I had part of our training was uh, Tai Chi with one with uh, one of the world's best Tai Chi teachers. I, her name escapes me in this moment, but uh, we were so ignorant I guess to the fact of the possible importance of that that because it was last thing on a Friday afternoon we used to bunk off and go to the pub because it didn't seem important but <laughs> the importance of those kind of somatic practices and t- things like yoga, Feldenkrais, Alexander Technique, um, Skinner releasing, contact improvisation, those those things are routinely taught now in dance trainings in the so, yeah, this is what I wanted to ask you about really just for my personal curiosity how somatic is one of these dance conservatoires. I mean, does it used to be more sort of just physical and performance-based, and, and now is there more of this, you know, Feldenkrais, Alexander Technique, Contact Impro, these kind of somatic practices, you said they're more widespread now? Yes, and uh, absolutely. What used to be considered left field in terms of dance, so these things, are contact improvisation, uh, which I was always really interested in. I used to bunk 
classes when I was at London Contemporary Dance School to go and do um, releasing and contact improvisation classes elsewhere. We should, we should probably explain the word bunk to our international listeners. That means playing hooky or, or skipping school. Yeah. So I used to skip school to go and do other things that I wasn't being offered. So, so those things 30 years ago were considered very left field. Mm. And now it's mainstream. It's part of what we offer to young dancers that the uh, embodiment practices and the ha- finding ways to for that to be integrated. So it's not other. It's not something separate. It's actually it's actually the fundamental underpinning of what makes a great dancer. In mm. So do you think there is a there is a real advantage for dancers to start to feeling it for studying? I remember I was in Russia not long ago and I watched a modern dance performance yeah. and there were sort of six dancers and only one of them looked like it was real for them. It looked like they were embodying it. Now on the surface they look quite similar. They're all doing the same jumps and twists and turns, but one of them seemed like they were feeling it. And it was a very different quality watching her than the other five in this little group that I was watching. And it was much more compelling to watch. Yeah. And, I, you know, is, is there a sort of advantage to kind of this somatic work for dancers? That's a good question. And I might answer that by speaking to uh, training for actors as well, because mm. I teach skin and releasing technique to actors. And um, as head of movement in the conservatoire where there, there are actors in training, I've also implemented a whole heap of other somatic practices for them. And sometimes those students are a little confused why they, they ask yep. me that? Why would we? Why would you want us to do that? What's what's the what's the, actually? I had a student say, "What's the point?" And I um, told them a story, a little like the one you've just relayed, which was about is about embodiment on stage, even for an actor. So, really, what they're saying with their words to so the text is is not so important. Actually, what's compelling is their embodiment. I then had to explain to them what embodiment means, but. Um, so in answer to your question, I haven't answered your question properly. What okay. <laughs> what? I, I don't expect dancers as an artist to answer my questions in linear fashion. So that would oh, be a that's little... great, because I, <laughs> I often go on a like that. But yeah, it's, it's, um, I think what's really key now in the dance world that people are catching up with is that it doesn't really matter how high you can kick your legs or how many pirouettes you can turn if you're not as you just phrased, feeling it, or I might say embodying. Uh, we, talk, we talk a lot in releasing technique about inner and outer uh, experiences becoming in, in, integrated. So the integration of what we're noticing inside and what we might see at the same time. And that's, for me, what makes a really compelling performer as well. Um, somebody who is able to be available for audience but not like overextending themselves and reaching out actually dropping back into sensation is really compelling to witness yeah there's a just want to point listeners to rachel blackman's episode on this who's an actor we had on who's really deep in somatic work with the early episodes on the podcast and i haven't heard that i'll listen to it thank you I work with her all the time. She brings a sort of acting sensibility that I don't have. And Francis Breyer is another colleague of mine who had a you know full acting training, and he would get a Alexander Technique lesson every day. You know that was just part of his acting training. I think it was Dartmouth. And um, you know it seems like some actors and dancers are like heavily into somatic work, and some have never even heard of it. Like it seems to have sort of missed them or passed them by. So it's, um, I'm, I'm, uh, these are the worlds that I understand least of the different somatic disciplines, probably dance and acting. So I'm, I'm coming at it as an outsider who's just, just curious, like, hey, are, are people taking advantage of these techniques? Because I know from my own... Right. It's not... Um, it's passing some parts of the dance world by. Mm. And mm. other parts of the dance world, younger dancers, might not even know, or act, and actors in training, might not even have heard of the term somatics. And yet they're doing it. So they don't right. even know. Like it's not necessarily always in their training explicit that, that okay, this is somatic practice and this is what we're doing. But actually it's becoming more and more integrated in the kind of teaching they're receiving. Yeah. As, as those, um, as I'm using my hands, you can't see me. As, as those things, those practices spread, uh, it, it's almost like... Uh, it's ripples, isn't it? Out into community and out into teachers. 
I, you know, I do wonder about the word embodiment generally. I suspect it may never become super common language, the word embodiment. But what I see increasingly is an embodied perspective just becoming integrated and implicit like in the yoga world for example it's just much more common now to talk about feeling into the posture and feeling if it's too much or too little rather than just copying the shape of the Iyengar book and in many many disciplines I wonder if it would just become a kind of implicit thing uh, that's in these other arts rather than something that's necessarily talked about explicitly. I think you're absolutely right and that's what I was just talking about that, that, that it's becoming it's, it, yeah, it's becoming implicit Having said that, I think what is very useful is if uh, for teachers to have an understanding of what they're doing or saying. Yeah. So I have a really, one of my things is about uh, something I've done a lot of research about and actually I, I'm, I'm writing about currently and I've spent 20 years refining really is the language we use when we're teaching. What we say really matters and how we say it really matters. Yeah, I'm a real stickler for this. It's one of the main things I teach when I teach teachers. And most uh, yoga teachers, are, I think dancers are some of the worst for this. I've been in modern dance classes and just been given instructions that make no sense, that just aren't clear instructions in any way. I mean, what, what are your sort of things that you say, like, hey, if you're teaching somatics embodiment, it'd be really helpful to know this about language. What are some of your main kind of bullet points on this? Okay, so it's really, it's, uh, it's huge for me, and this is really important. In re I can talk specifically about that in terms of releasing. So in Skinner releasing technique... Do you want to define that first? Because, you know, I don't know what it is, and most listeners won't either. So Skinner releasing technique is a, a dance technique that was developed by Joan Skinner in America. She mm. was a dancer with Merce Cunningham, um, who is a modern dance choreographer, and uh, Martha Graham. She was um, very badly injured. She had a very bad back injury and she wanted to work out how she could support longevity, not only in her own dance career, but for other people. So at the same time, she was um, encountering Eastern philosophy through John Cage, the composer John Cage and Zen philosophies. And she was reading and interested in a lot of that. She's also, um, read a lot of poetry particularly the American poet Emily Dickinson and she was a big fan of haiku so she began to do and and was doing at the kind of forefront of early modern dance improvisation so she just she started developing this dance technique um, and it's uh, it's highly codified so there are 15 classes in the introductory series it's, it's a pedagogy mm. so 12 classes in the ongoing series the teacher training is really rigorous. It takes two years and you have to be certified to teach it. It's very interesting in that way because um, lots of other postmodern dance techniques, you're not, there's no certification. So things yeah. like improvisation, which are passed from teacher to student, rather like folk stories. Yeah. So there is, there's a whole debate about that. But I feel that uh, uh, the certification is a really good thing and it gives a real structure and rigor to the understanding that teachers have of what they're passing on. And there are scripts. Um, so the work is, uh, if you take class one somewhere in the UK and then you take what class one somewhere else in the world, more or less you'll receive the same information. So there's a lot of clarity because of that. Mm -hmm. The language that we use is very, very specific bringing us back around to language. Is that enough of an introduction? What does it look like? What does it look like? That's yeah. a very good question. So what's really interesting is that Joan Skinner was very clear that this is a dance technique. However, it looks like <laughs> an improvisation class slash meditation session slash hands-on bodywork session. Yeah, I'm actually bringing That's up... what it looks like. Yeah, I'm bringing up a video now and there's people kind of touching each other, kind of moving together like they were doing body work, rolling around on the floor. I'm literally just flipping through a YouTube video here. Okay. It looks pretty kind of modern, pretty um, abstract in some ways. Yeah. What, what's the point? Like, what is it for health? Is it for emotional expression? Like, what's the, the reason for its being? People come to it for very many, dif for many different reasons. As I said, um, Joan Skinner developed it as a, training for dancers because so that they weren't 
so they could have a long working life as a dancer. However, in my experience and my students come from many different places and reasons. I work with people who are visual artists and creative people because it really taps into creativity. Um, people who are interested in kind of more yogi people who are interested mm. in self-development, uh, people who have got physical problems and want are interested in health, fitness, alignment, or are recovering from injury and professional dancers. And what I really love about the work is that it's non-hierarchical. So in a normal, an average contemporary dance class, you, you're going in and you're like in beginners, intermediate or advanced class. Yeah. And if you cross between them, it would be quite rubbish for you often. Yeah. You can't be a beginner and go to an advanced class. However, with the releasing work, I the teacher can accommodate everybody in the room because you work at your own level. So I've taught classes, open workshop with a principal dancer from Birmingham Royal Ballet, professional contemporary dancers, a 65 year old with serious arthritis who'd never done any dancing before, but it, and a, a poet, yeah, visual artist, live artist, students, um, painters, all sorts of different people. And it's possible to be in the same room because the material is um, you're working with image and you work from where you are. You work with where you're at. So, and there's no steps to learn. Yeah, I was, I was once, uh, right. I, I'm a sort of keen amateur dancer. So, you know, I can move, right? I do martial arts and other things. I can dance a bit. I've done contact for a few years and stuff like that. But I've been in a few modern dance things where there was step. And very quickly, I fell behind, you know, the pros who were used to following the steps and just felt like a complete muppet. And it was pretty unpleasant, you know. Whereas uh, that actually can make bring up all sorts of voices in people's head and make them feel terrible about themselves. And you know, I mean, I'm a professional dancer, and it, I have been, I've been in that situation. Mm. You know, even as a, 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 you know, very good professional dancer, I don't. And actually, now I can't. This is very challenging for me. I can't go to professional class anymore that has class with set, set material steps because. I don't like it, and because my body doesn't, won't my body won't play ball with that stuff anymore because I do so much improvising. I, I feel I, what I feel is two levels of resistance. One is my own sort of neurosis about um, being told what to do, and my own kind of personality kind of kickback, and that, that's kind of quite interesting to work with and actually do the opposite of what it would have, you know to build my range to yeah. choose to conform. But then there's another piece which is more authentic, maybe, or deeper, which is like, you know, my, sometimes my body just wants to do what it wants to do. And they're, they're kind of forcing oneself into form, whether it be yoga or martial arts or dance. When you've got enough somatic back, background, it starts to feel like an anathema. It starts to feel violent almost. Do you know what I mean? Totally know what you mean. And it feels, I, this is... I mean, this is an aside. This is a, this is a personal thing. At the minute, um, there's a the city I live in in Birmingham in the UK has this beautiful, um, growing, emerging independent dance community. It's really it's not as developed as as it is in London yet, but there's some really great people putting really great stuff together. And um, I teach the open professional classes for them sometimes. Uh, we, and lots of people come, which is wonderful. But I, there aren't any classes that I can go to because I exactly what you were just talking about. So my physical practice, I go. I is my yoga practice either uh, alone or in class, and then I have to go away from the city I live in to go and do releasing classes or improvisation. Mm. Which is well, good. well, if you could send me the dates of where I could try a bit of this, I'm always curious to try different stuff. And if, if you've got any dates in the diary for kind of one or two day things going on this year or next year, then uh, send them my way because it sounds like something fun to explore. I totally will. Um, I personally am not teaching many open... I used to teach quite a lot of open workshops and I'm not doing that on at the minute, but uh, definitely... Can, you're in Brighton, right? Yeah, yeah. I and mean, like places like The Place in London are pretty easy for me to get to. Okay, so there's some there's great people teaching in London and, and independent dance in um, Elephant and Castle in London. There's often... Skin and really Siobhan Davis. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've looked at, actually, they, they do, just a little shout out, people in London, Siobhan Davis Dance Studio, does re, which is uh, just off Elephant and Castle, does these really accessible classes that don't cost a lot of money and that anyone can do. I'm actually thinking of just going to spend a month in London and just doing the classes every morning. 
as a sort of little doing at independent dance at Siobhan Davis Dance Studios is outstanding. I mean, I have, I have friends and colleagues who work there and I teach there. And they also do um they do intensives, workshops as well, really great kind of three day or week stuff. So keep your eye out for that. Yeah, I saw um, various teachers on the schedule, like Charlie Morrissey, who are kind of like world-class dancers. You can do a class with them for a fiver. I was like... Do you know Charlie? He's outstanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was my first contact teacher years oh, ago. In there you go. Charlie and I, I know Charlie very well. Small world. <laughs> <laughs> I was in an art performance once, doing contact improv with him and talking with him while doing it. And I, you know, felt quite, never felt quite so graceless. We, 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 <laughs> We have almost exactly the same proportions of bodies, which I think is why he grabbed me, because I'm not a pro, but uh, it was kind of fun. Charlie so, has moved from Brighton. He's got a beautiful studio now. In a, it's it's um, a church hall in uh, Hebden Bridge, and he's oh, doing he's he? beautiful workshops and hosting people. So that's another thing maybe look at for workshops or movement stuff around the, around this area to do. Nice, nice. Okay, so in terms of Skinner releasing today then, I mean, is it still sort of going strong? Is it global? Like, what's the scene like for this practice? It's it's really going strong and it's totally global. What is quite interesting is that although it's uh, um, um, American, its founders are American, it seems to have really found a home in the UK. There seems to be something in the sensibility of it that um, the the, the Brits like. I'm not sure what that is um, entirely. Maybe I need to give that some more thought. But it's also global. So the last teacher training, actually, I, I haven't been there, but there's a big scene in Turkey now. And the last teacher training took place in Turkey. The way the teacher trainings happen is usually they, they, they were always in America and they uh, have started, wait, they wait until there's enough students ready to do the next teacher training and then, then make it happen. The Skinner Releasing Institute. Um, mm. But the, the, the one before last happened in the UK. I was partly helped to bring that to the UK, to Coventry University, where I was at the time. And students came from uh, Australia, New Zealand, Italy, Vienna, or Austria, um, and the UK, some other places. And the, 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 the one that's just happened was in Turkey, and it was mostly, I think, Turkish dancers and teachers so it's quite interesting, interesting. It's a, it's a scene there good friend Uslem who's a dance movement therapist in Turkey I wonder if she was there so it, I, I do find it fascinating like where different dance forms blossom or different yeah. dramatic forms and it's a little bit off topic but you mentioned it as well like you know it's, how is it that certain things come from I don't know uh, Israel or the United States a lot of things or Central Europe some of the older ones and then they find homes in different countries and it, it's, it's sometimes it's to do with the personality of the teachers you know like I do pretty well in Russia and Israel just because I'm abrasive yeah. and it's it's like sometimes it's to do with just random factors like I have a particularly good um, student who does a lot of he's good at marketing in Russia and that's just a random fortuitous thing you know like I, I find it quite interesting where things land. I think that I think you're, it's so curious, and I think it's a mixture of things. Um, definitely for releasing, I think I don't know what it is about the sensibility that uh, it, why it's landed so well in the UK, and I, I need to look at that and have give that some thought, perhaps. But I definitely know it also was about a timing thing, in terms of it was introduced to the both the conservatoire and the university dance training because of the people who were around at the time. So Kirsty Alexander, who was head of, uh, 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 assistant head, I think, at London Contemporary Dance School, and then at Larbon, introduced it there. Uh, just a little bit later, I was uh, co-head of dance, at, uh, co-course director for dance at Coventry University, and introduced it onto the curriculum there. So, and there were people teaching at Middlesex University. So I wonder if some of it's about timing as well as sensibilities. Like contract yeah. supervisation, yeah, it's a huge scene in the UK, but also a slightly different part of the scene in slightly hippie parts of Europe. So like Ibiza and bits of Spain, and the slightly tantra side of it is kind of big there. Yeah, yeah, in different places, contact will have a kind of sexier feel or a more professional oh. dance feel or a more I'm amateur not feel. Talking about that, I'm, I'm. <laughs> I have some quite strong feelings about that whole in-touch thing, but maybe this is not the time play. 
don't know if you want. It's, uh, it's, it's. I don't know. I just really, I'm really, really big on boundaries. Yeah. Uh, uh, that is that is related to a number of things. The thing that I was talking about earlier about language, why we yeah. why we say matters when we're teaching, but also. You know, the moment we get into a teacher-student relationship, there's all sorts of old emotional stuff and transference that can come up. And I think there's been lots of conversations in the in the contact improvisation world for a long time about boundaries, about sex, about blurring of those boundaries. And it's, it's interesting because in the UK, we people have worked really hard to keep people safe within that form. Um, and <clears throat> there's a whole emerging scene around the edges of contact improvisation and sex. And I guess if people want to choose to I- I- engage in that, that's up to them. But it's not my thing. Um, I think it's yeah. And I mean, it's interesting for me. We've had a couple of contact teachers on. We had a Dai from Israel and another Israeli, actually two Israelis, both both contact people. And uh, we've got Martin Keo, is it coming on? Oh, so, great! He's fabulous. Yeah, I've heard good things. So we're exploring contact, and that you know that's been a practice. I was dancing contact on on Sunday actually, yeah. and it is it is boundaryless in a way, right? It's all about blending and merging and kind of going right into each other's body, a you know, hip to hip contact. It's um it's got that capacity in its form to be a bit boundaryless, but but as you say, I think it's all about choice, isn't it? So if I go to a dance festival and there's a tent and it says you know touch and play contact adults only then I'm, I've got some idea what I'm getting clothing optional you know then I've got some idea what I'm getting into absolutely but if you are engaged in a I, I, I'm not sure I agree with your last thing about it being boundaryless actually I know what you're saying but if I'm if I'm then choosing to be in the tent that is a contact improvisation session I've chosen not to go to the touch and play session right yeah and I don't want somebody extending their sexual energy without taking responsibility for it. That's yeah, what. yeah, I agree. And I, I think, you know, one of the, right? let me retake boundaryless and just say that, that it is, for me, a practice of boundaries. Yeah. And sometimes saying, well, actually, no, I don't want to dance or I don't want to, you know, sometimes people yeah. just throw themselves very close at me and I just, I'm not really feeling that right now. Yeah. Forget about the sexual piece, just, just, just in terms of intimacy and distance and, yeah, yeah. you know, how close I want someone's sweaty body to mine. And it's, yeah. um, you know, I feel like it's quite a good place to learn boundaries and negotiate that if there's a safe holding. And obviously, you know, teachers are in positions of authority and power and dancers don't always, um, like yoga teachers, don't always understand some of the therapeutic issues around power and responsibility and boundaries and relation. And why should they? Because it's not in their training. I mean, nobody explains countertransference to the average dancer, do they? But I think they should. Uh-huh. So what do you think should be in the training, like in terms of for someone? Well, doing- uh, not, not necessarily to the average dancer, but in a teacher training, mm. it's really important that we have an awareness of what uh, what this brings up for people and how to hold that space safely and responsibly. Um, I feel quite strongly about that. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. Okay, so back back to kind of Skinner releasing then. So you're still deeply involved in the kind of Skinner releasing world today. Absolutely, yeah. I've just I've just agreed to be uh, temporarily treasurer for the Skinner releasing network because uh, they were having a we we were having a shake up with the oh, the the current committee had done it for a number of years and they need mm. um so yeah I'm I'm pretty involved with that community um I teach the work. Um, weekly i teach it to acting students i teach it to professional dancers so yeah i'm uh really advocating for that work it is interesting because in the oh eight years i've been certified as a teacher for eight years and i've been dancing the work for 20 years um since i first more than that for a long time um 1994 i encountered the work with Gabby Agus, who was my teacher, my first teacher, and became a very good, is a very dear friend. And um, it's interesting because before I certified as a teacher, I was working as a dancer, and before I certified as a Skinner releasing teacher, I was working as a dancer and a teacher and a choreographer. And I was teaching contact improvisation, I was teaching instant composition, I was teaching contemporary dance classes, and I don't teach any of that stuff anymore. I teach Skinner releasing. Well, what, what, why is the sort of passion there? I mean, there's so many good, so much good stuff out there. What is it that really appeals to you about it? There's... 
Uh, I really enjoy the freedom that uh, uh, pedagogy gives me. It's it's a little uh, ironic or perhaps even counterintuitive in a way, but what it gives me is I don't want to sound too fucking hippie or daft here, but it's not it's not channeling. But because because I know that work so intimately, uh, I and. It, it, I, I'm, an, I'm able to put my own ego aside a little so I'm not like if if somebody in the class is not feeling it or they don't come back or whatever I know it's the work not necessarily it's not like I don't then get into it doesn't throw me into my own shit does that make sense because like before when I was teaching mm. work that I'm devising myself then I'm there's always my own stories in it. There's always our own stories in whatever we're teaching. Of course, we bring ourselves to the room. But the underpinning clarity of teaching a practice that is understood and certifiable gives me a real clarity in my teaching. Uh huh. Yeah, there's something nice about being part of a lineage and a tradition and, and something that has that clarity there. It can, it can put your own ego aside a little bit. Like I just say, okay, here's the first five Aikido wrist locks and, you know, the, the, there's been changes to how they've been done, but this is the system and these are the five basic Aikido throws and I may have opinions there, but I'm, I'm kind of putting my ego aside a little bit. Yeah, exactly that. And uh, I mean, I guess I'm very fortunate because I came to the Skinner Releasing Technique teacher training as a very experienced, with, with 20, nearly 20 years of teaching experience anyway. So I understood what it was to be a teacher and then to have the added support of this I feel like the technique gives me a real support. It's great. I really enjoy that. And it frees me. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a nice to look at a tradition as a support rather than a limitation. And as you say, that it's freeing within that. Because it for me, what that does, it takes me out of the center of the picture, which is a tremendous fucking relief. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's a tremendous relief. And it also enables me to be a more available i'm holding a space for people in yeah aside from myself to hold a space for people it's great it's nice also um it's pretty it is pretty exhausting as well to hold a space in that way for people mm. you know, when they, when when you're t taking people right into their own process <laughs> we talk about this notion of being in process a lot and it's been a releasing technique it's pretty it's pretty heavy or you kind of make yourself in, you make yourself as a teacher invisible in a way, but then you're really clearly you're holding this space for people's stuff. I know how exhausting that is, and I think it's while people are in deep process, mm -hmm. the the holding of that is underestimated by people in terms of how exhausting that can be. Yeah, I, you're absolutely right. It's a it's a great privilege and honour. But it's fucking exhausting. So, but I come back from teaching a retreat. I usually have to take to my bed for a couple of days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got I've got better at sort of self care before and after those kind of events, and even things like evenings. Just like even though I'm pretty extra, I often have to be alone on the evenings where I'm really facilitating um, intense somatic work. Because and also like these little rituals like changing my clothes and showering and dealing with the kind of some of the projective stuff and working with trauma issues this is even more the case. Yeah, I tend to tend to on those kind of retreats. It's curious as well because students, understandably, really reach out to you, so they want yep. everybody wants a little piece of you. At not everybody, but you know, at like lunch and dinner. And so I often would like leave. It's very challenging for me because my habit is my, my desire, kind of innate desire, will be to stay up all night and party. You know, so I have to like extract myself and take myself to my bed and look after myself you know i have i have heard stories of stories of teachers being followed like to the toilet <laughs> There's a weird clinginess that happens with students. God love me, because what I think happens is they love the work and they go, wow, this is deep and meaningful and transformative. And, um, you know, it's, I'm waking me up to my own body and my own life. But then the mistake they make is to think that's personal to the teacher. And I, I, I remember there was, um, actually just to sort of that point a little bit more, there was a, a, a colleague of mine and we were teaching pretty much the same work. And I taught a piece of work and, and the students had a similar reaction to when he taught it. And he was like, oh, it's not me, it's the work. Yeah. But then the students make the mistake of whoever's teaching it, thinking it, if they're junior students anyway, just to give credit to people that have been around a bit longer, 
is thinking it's me or him or whoever. Um, and then there's that sort of really clinging, like wanting to cling to you to get nearer the source of the goodness, not thinking, not realizing that's not the source. And actually, the source is them, right? Because their process is their process. I, like, it, I can drop an image or an idea or a notion into the space, but where a student goes with it, that's up to them. So it's yeah. their, 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 they're doing the work, the work you know? Mm. Okay, so you're doing a lot of this. You're also involved in various kind of arts projects, right? Well, yeah, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teacher and I'm an artist, a choreographer, a dancer. Although I don't do some, as I said, I don't do so much dancing these days. Just I'm getting older, you know. I mean, I have, I have co fabulous colleagues like Charlie Mor friends, colleagues like Charlie Morrissey and Katie Coe and other people. People have very long dance careers. But I've found myself in sort of uh, management-y positions as well in in the jobs I'm do the job I've chosen to do at the moment at the conservatoire so I do less dancing um but I'm yeah I make work so I have a long-term screen dance practice actually I make I make dance films um often multiple multiple screen installations and that's uh, that actually came out of making performance work and suffering terribly with performance nerves and wondering how to do how to share the work in a different format. Plus, it came out of wanting embodiment in a way, wanting an audience to get really close up and intimate with what I was doing and sensation, trying that in performance and it just not working and going, okay, maybe I could do that with a camera. So I make yeah, I make screen dance and I'm then more recently doing. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm working it out. I'm, I'm in the middle this week of a research project around, um, I'm very interested in the slow movement. So I'm next week convening a conference uh, inside the International Birmingham International Dance Festival called Slowing and Stilling. And it's about long-term practice. What it means as a dancer, artist, performer to have a long-term practice. Because so often we are, uh, involved these days as dancers and choreographers because of funding cuts often in short-term projects that happen to have to happen fast and what I'm interested in is long-term practice so my other longest term practice really is gardening and and I have an allotment and I'm, I'm doing this thing this week and last week where I'm there every day and inviting people to come and try people be part of that experience um, i don't quite know what it is yet at some point it might become a performance or a film or something but right now it's just about um acknowledging the work that digging the earth is acknowledging uh how uh, uh, a space and uh space in nature in an uh urban environment is a like a sanctuary sure. what's been really curious is that people have been coming and um, being really open-hearted, it's amazing. Like telling me their sorrows and their stories about love and sorrow and joy and all sorts of things. And that wasn't my intention. It wasn't meant to be tea and sympathy. And it, it's been really beautiful, actually. It's quite curious. So that's, yeah, and I'm blogging about it, which is new for me because I don't really, I'm not well about social media. I do it a bit, but um, I'm doing this. I always, I always kept... Uh, artistic journals that's not unique to me um that we write in skinner releasing technique at the end of every class we write it's like stream of consciousness writing or mark making and I've, I've always written and um so i'm doing this blog every day it's weird it feels a bit like an echo chamber because i don't know who the fuck i'm talking to mm. but well, then my partner said I was like, I think nobody's reading it, but it doesn't really matter. And he said, have a look. I was like, oh my God, it's like had 360 views in three days, shit. <laughs> three. No one's looking at it. No one's left a comment though, I don't mind, but it's really interesting because it's like, it's different from social media because there's no feedback and I quite like that in a way. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think, you know, something pure in that, and it, it, there isn't just a conversation and a big argument the entire time. The same with a podcast, you know, I'm speaking to you and right, you know, a thousand people are going to hear this. In the, you know, in the day it's released and it's it, but we're not so aware of them being there looking and talking to the audience it's just more like just me having a genuine conversation with you yeah and i'm i'm interested in what you're doing as well then at the minute are you going on retreat um I, yeah i'm taking a three-month sabbatical 
Mm-hmm. Um, just like these, this will actually be probably by the time this is released, will be towards the end of that. I've built up a bit of a backlog deliberately of um, of episodes. They can be released continuously while I'm away. Um, yeah, it just struck me after 10 years of running a business doing embodiment, it was time to step back a little bit and have a bit of space. It feels like time and space is the new money, you know? But that's the kind of rare thing in society these days. And um, it's been quite interesting reactions from people when I've told them I'm taking three months out. It's jealousy, amazement, resentment, uh, a joy... Uh, people asking how on earth I can spend three months off email. So that, that's kind of interesting. Are you going to spend three months off email? Yeah, three months totally off email, mostly off social media. And I'm working a very small amount in Australia and New Zealand just to kind of pay the bills and just because I've never been out there before and a few people wanted a workshop. But basically, it's, I'm sort of working maybe on average two or three days a month for those those months. So um, ah. yeah, so that's interesting. Ooh. Yeah, the, ne- the next five years, I'm retraining in various systems and almost doing only doing 20% teaching and 80% training again, um, which, again, has aroused lots of interesting emotions and things in people when I tell them that. So, uh, it's, so, it's so interesting what you just said about... You just said um, what I heard you say was about taking time out and slowing. And this thing about... And I'm reading a lot at the minute about... Uh, the slow movement, which started mm. in, in the f- slow food in Italy, of course it did, um, in the 80s, and is now kind of spreading its reach. And there's whole, all sorts of theories around slow well, food and architecture, yeah. sex and gardening and, and, and performance practice, reaching performance practice in academia. There's a new book called The Slow Professor. And um, I'm... By nature, pretty slow anyway. Yeah. It takes me a long time to like it takes me at least a year to make a piece of work, like a choreography. In yeah. some ways, it takes me a long time to process it. Once it then comes to fruition, it's like bang, it's fast. It yeah, everyone has their own cycle. I've seen in embodiment terms. We have a model for this that we use, the seasons model. But I, 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 I was talking to a corporate coach friend of mine yesterday. She's in Belgium, and we she works at very high levels in business. We, we both agreed. It's just got so insane with people being like, even this week, as I gear up to being away, everything's, you know, I've got 12 hour days, six days a week and you know, every minute of the day is accounted for that level of um, lack of space yeah. plus speed. Cause it's a, it's a, it's a density plus a speed yeah. and busyness and connectedness has just got to a point where it's really making people sick. And I feel like it's hit a limit. And the interesting thing is what's happened is it's become high status not to be like that. So I think it's actually going to become the fashion in the same way as it was the fashion to have a tan and everyone started going to Spain and it's not anymore. Like it's going to become the fashion to be spacious because it's just going to become a sign of status. And it's also just going to become a necessity when the world hits a wall at high speed, which is what it's doing right now. It's getting of workaholism being held up as as fucking something to be admired. I mean, it's just terrible. It's terrible, and it's just, you know, it's like this kind of illness running through our culture that it's it's applauded. You know, they work so hard. They've been in office so long. And, you know, it's, it was a status claim. I mean, it was the glorification of busy was a real status claim. I think. And now the opposite's happening. If you go to the very, very people that are most successful now, they're all sort of stepping back and chilling out. So I think that's going to shift the culture. Um, and this is, I'm really, I'm, that's part of what I'm really, I'm going to say trying, I hate, I don't like trying. What, what I'm doing really is to slow down as much as I can. I mean, I have, you know, I have a job, but it, 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 there's, there's a, an, on, an online, mm, I don't know what's called magazine journal on being and uh omid safi says uh, i've quoted this in this blog i'm writing yesterday the day before actually um when people say, you say to people like how are you and they go mm. i'm just so busy like busy. i'm so busy yeah. it's like a mark of status and yeah guys i know darling we all are but i want to know how your heart is doing today <laughs> yeah it's become the knee-jerk yeah. response but as i said i think it's the highest status people I know, the most successful people are now boasting in the opposite way. So I feel like the fashion. Doing that. That's hilarious. I am a bit because this week I'm like, I try, I'm, I'm on, I'm on this research project, and I'm spending three hours a day at the allotment, or four some days, 
at dawn, at, at, at sunset, at different times of the day with this open invitation for people to join me. Nobody came mm. today, which was brilliant. I got loads of digging. <laughs> Can we go back to gardening, actually? Because there was a survey done in the UK asking people what their hobbies were. Yeah. And in order, the three most popular hobbies in the UK were gardening, sex and fishing, in that order. Marvellous. And they're all sort of embodied things. <laughs> And it's incredibly British, but it's been all over the world. People garden, but we garden, we love it. You know, the, the allotment is a sort of, um, just for list, foreign listeners, that's a small plot of land. It goes back to World War II when people would grow their own potatoes and things, you know. And I think um, it much much before love. that, because people didn't, in inner cities, they were living in filthy, overcrowded situations, and the government puts up aside getting the land to grow. Maybe it is World War II, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so but it strikes me that a lot of people know who garden, it's a very embodied spiritual practice for them. Yeah, there's very little written on it. There's a sort of snobbery around saying, well, yoga's embodied and dance is art and that's embodied. But gardening, that's just sort of something kind of old people do. Well, it's a hobby. There's a thing, isn't it? When it's listed as the top three hobbies. And yeah. this is the thing that I'm really curious about at the moment because it's actually the thing I spend most... The, the biggest amount of time doing, apart from fielding emails, uh, and uh, the thing I like doing the most, and it's, it's my most creative practice. So I, I, it's way more than a hobby, and now I'm trying to work out how it can be my work more and more, which is what this research project I'm doing is about. And it's so embodied. It's You know that in the UK, for our American listeners, um, Gardening is prescribed for uh, for as a treatment for depression. <laughs> well, it's outdoors. It's a bit of exercise. You know, being around the there's the whole eco psychology movement. I mean, there's various. There's also, there's also but... science about uh, the microbes in the soil. Don't garden with gloves on because the microbes in the soil cross uh, the skin and they have a antidepressant action. Yeah. So does semen, just to throw that in there as well. Thanks for that, Mark. Well, no, I want to spread this rumour far and right. It's scientific evidence that people that have semen in them are happier. That's actually scientifically established. Yeah, I'm talking about gardening though, so... Either the dirt or the semen, one or the other. Great, right. all of them, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> where where, so the, so the, where have we gone with this episode? It's a uh, colleague. I think it's mostly my fault, but uh... it's, good. it's all good for me. It's um, there's there's something as well about uh, gardening and growing that you know in terms of this whole slow movement thing, but also in terms of art and dance and embodiment, it requires a deep optimism. It requires deep patience. It requires a letting go of expectations of what is going to happen. And all of those are principles in Skinner Releasing Technique. Letting go, being available to possibility. So those, um, you know, those parallels are really clear for me. And I'm more and more curious about that. Um, I think there's something in gardening. Going, but say that again, sorry. Well, gardening acknowledges from the start there's a future at least a few months away. It says, you know, that I'm going to plant this and it will grow in a bit. And, you know, it's not an, it's not an immediate thing to plant, to grow tomatoes or potatoes or whatever. There's a sort of trust in the future there. And it's connected. There's, there's no instant gratification. Yeah, a lack of instant gratification that's there. And a, and a re, you know, it's a reconnection to something which is pretty fundamental, both the land itself. I, by the way, I was a gardener and that was my job, but I, I was doing a psychology degree at university and doing, when I gave up drug dealing, I started um, gardening as my um, summer job and spring job. So in the holidays, I would always garden and I go from this very heavy academic environment to having my hands in the ground. I used to find it very therapeutic after being in this super kind of cognitive university environment. I mean, that's, um, that's kind of, you just spoke my life, really. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think there's really something in that. I, I, I kind of would like us to kind of be able to look at, you know, like surfing is cool and extreme sports are cool and a kind of, you know, yoga is pretty cool, martial arts, but look, why, why can't gardening be included in that? Maybe this is a very British episode, Polly. But, um, <laughs> I, I, I no, actually, actually, I'm having a conversation with a friend, colleague in America at the moment who's also a Skinner releasing technique teacher and she is growing a garden and we are talking about those things. So. 
maybe it's not just maybe it's not just British. It's not just the British, though. I, I do I do feel the British have a particular relationship to nature, uh, which is quite interesting in terms of our response to it. I don't see some of the Central Europeans or the Europeans generally, the Mediterraneans, even more having quite that same relationship. I guess um, they can also that that you know they have they have the weather that we don't have and climate that wouldn't doesn't allow for I don't want to be damning of our European neighbours here. You know, there's nothing like the English countryside in May and June when it's been raining for months and it all comes into its greenery. It's it's magnificent and we can grow stuff here. We can't grow, you know, the good stuff that they can grow we can't grow the peppers and things like that, but you know the green greenery of it. Maybe I don't know. I'm waffling now. <laughs> we don't know what we're talking about now. But we need to wrap up fairly simple. Are there any other sort of major aspects of your work or topics that we haven't touched upon yet? I don't know. It's it's curious because we um, the approach you came to me about Skinner releasing technique. That was our initial conversation, and we seem to have talked about lots of other things, which I. I I don't mind one little bit and I like um I don't know if I've said enough about the releasing work but maybe that doesn't matter well I, I think we've probably I mean first of all for me thank you because I, I often sometimes <laughs> when you're an example of a guest I had I just because I wanted to learn something I was like what's Skinner releasing let's get a Skinner releasing I said enough to, for you to understand that a little well I think it kind of perked my curiosity it made me want to like look at YouTube videos and go to courses at you know Elephant and Castle and all the rest of it so very, I, mean, I have to say actually there's very for our listeners there's very little uh, there's not much out there. If people want to do a bit of reading. There are a number of papers on the Skinner Releasing Network website under resources. Mm. Pretty much everything that's ever been published, which is a, a handful of journal papers. In terms of YouTube, <laughs> so people there. can see it because often with movement, it's in the seeing. Is there a particular kind of YouTube video you'd recommend for people to actually? No, I, need, I need to do a bit of research. I don't think there are very many. I, I I'll, have just, a, I'll, I'll have a look. I maybe can come back to you and email you. I'll have a look. Yeah, just let us know because what I turned up wasn't that great. There was a uh, couple of dodgy looking videos, one in German. Um, yeah, so not. The, I, I, other, a li- the other problem is as well. Um, and this is a this is a little a bit of an issue is is that um, in order to teach if people are interested in this work mm. please check that your teacher is a certified Skinner releasing technique teacher mm. because a lot of people say they're teaching releasing some of that is good practice that is informed by different embodied dance movement um, practices. Some of it is not always. So if you want Skinner releasing technique in its purest form, check that your teacher is certified. And if they're saying they are teaching it and they're not certified, they're not supposed to be teaching it. It's a, it's a, it's a trademark. Okay, so it's one of those things that has a very, like, five rhythms that has a very firm boundary to it. And there's pros and cons to that, as we were talking about earlier. Absolutely, yeah, and it does, yeah. But I don't think that, I, I don't know, I'll have a look, Mark, and uh, maybe I'll yeah. email you if I find a good video. Yeah, let us know. Um, obviously, you're at the, uh, Birmingham, the Birmingham City University, it's a Bur- Royal Birmingham Conservatoire. Yeah. There's a, dance, there's a book coming out soon as well. Uh, which is pending and I think there are more 20 or something chapters in it by Skinner releasing technique teachers about their experience of the work so that will be the first book about the work and it's long long needed and much awaited that's um, yeah I don't think I found one when I looked on online so I'm a bit of a geek for these things Manny, Manny Emsley who's a wonderful Skinner teacher is um is editing that book and there's lots of chapters from lots of people including myself but uh it's it you know as ever these things take time um but that will be coming out i think i think next year okay in terms of your website the blog you mentioned is polyhudsonblog.wordpress.com and that's p-o-l-l-y with no e hudson h-u-d-s-o-n blog.wordpress.com right yeah, I think so. I don't know. I haven't got it in front of me. Huh. Um, do you have a kind of professional site as well? I, I found you on the university website. Yeah, I'm on the university website with my sort of academic profile. And then, um, oh, God, Polly, I think, polyhudson.com. Yeah, that, that website needs updating. I'm not very good at that stuff, Mark. I need to get <laughs> I did it like hell for leather a few years ago. So there's some links to my, some of my film works and stuff on there. And I think, like, 
the latest news was from 2015 when some of the works won some awards. So it's a bit out of date. I probably I there it is. take a, it down or redo it. There's a 1980s lit picture of you looking longingly on your side. No, that's not 1980s. That's 2015. It's a still. Wow. From- is that your back as well? Yeah. I'm, I'm admiring your back in a red dress. I hope that's not inappropriate. It's so um, fine. It's out there, right? I'll, I'll put it, I'll put it, I'll, I'll link that as well, should people okay, be curious. Please. Okay, Polly, final message about the body, something you want to say about the body to leave with our listeners. Oh, oh, this has been a, a beautiful, oh. amiable British ramble through the, through the gardens of embodiment. Um, give me a second, think about it. Yeah, that. no worries, no rush. Slow podcasting, it's the latest thing. Oh, I know, final message about embodiment. Um, so this is a thing, you know, releasing technique. The breath is our constant companion and we don't need to do anything to change or alter our breathing in any way. We can just let it be. Nice. Polly, thank you so much for joining us today. You're so welcome. When, when, when is this coming out? Subscribe to get more. And you can also leave us a review on iTunes, which helps with our rankings. So really appreciate that. Um, equally, if you want to support the podcast even more, then fund us. Um, go to Patreon. Give us a dollar per episode. Um, those who don't know, Patreon's a really good way of supporting things you want to see more of in the world. I know like so much is available for free now. And, you know, what I'd say is a lot of energy and effort goes into this podcast. Um, I put it out there for free so everyone can get it. You know, more than I work on this. Everyone that wants it can have it for free. Uh, and if you want to support us, it is really appreciated. So it's patreon.com slash Mark Walsh. And of course, if you want any in-person training, you can visit embodiedfacilitator.com. There's loads more resources there too. Till next time, welcome home to the body.